Thank you. Hinduism is a powerful worldview and many of facets of Hindu worldview are finding uh, acceptance, growing acceptance in the West. And in these lectures, uh, we are touching on several um, aspects of Hinduism. The first sun, uh, Wednesday, we talked about karma and reincarnation. Today, our focus in on is on science, how a number of serious and good scientists feel, believe that Hinduism could provide a possible philosophical framework for insights of uh, the cutting edge physics and biology and many other disciplines that what we are learning from scientific method can be best understood in uh, a Hindu philosophical framework. So that's the focus for uh, this Wednesday. This isn't a full lecture on Hinduism. My purpose is limited and we don't have enough time to uh, do justice to even that uh, limited objective, which is uh, the, uh, how so many people are drawn to Hinduism because of their studies and reflection on science, especially uh, new physics and the implica implications of quantum mechanics. But I do want to begin with uh, discussing uh, differentiating Hindu worldview and Hinduism as a religion. While Hindu worldview is uh, finding acceptance in the West, Hindu religion per se has not taken strong roots in the West. And uh, my feeling is that it is because Hinduism is not a universal religion. It's easy to become a Buddhist. It's easy to become a Muslim, to become a Christian. It's not that easy to become a Hindu because in Hinduism, merit is accumulated uh, or accrued to you through birth. The Hare Krishna movement tried to say that anyone who becomes Hare Krishna uh, becomes a Vaishnavite Brahmin. And that would mean that a sweeper and untouchable in India, if he became a Hare Krishna, he becomes a Brahmin. Now, obviously, Hindus couldn't accept that. So, uh, Hare Krishna movement has lost a lot of Western following. And if you go to Hare Krishna temples now, it's mostly Indians who are uh, immigrants here who are worshipping in those temples uh, because uh, Hinduism just didn't accept. It's an ethnic religion. It's a particular religion. It's not a universal religion. So Hinduism as a religion hasn't taken off in the West, and I don't see it taking off uh, significantly uh, in the West. So we are not really talking about Hinduism as a religion. We are talking about Hinduism as a worldview. Now, the, I think the problem is best illustrated with uh, the, a case that is going on currently in the Californian Education Department. A uh, number of Hindus, parents and students objected to about 170 specific uh, mentions of Hinduism, India, Indian history, and the way it is portrayed in textbooks in California from 6th grade to 10th grade. And uh, the impact of political correctness was such that the education department was willing to listen to the representation from these Hindu bodies and change all of these 170 uh, specific references until a professor, uh, Michael Witzel from Harvard, he objected and he said that if uh, California does that, it will just become a laughing stock of uh, scholarship throughout the world that uh, in intellectual integrity and scholarship has no place in the academic world anymore. All that matters is political correctness. So the education department uh, decided to rethink and they set up a committee including uh, Stanley Wolpert of UCLA 
uh, history department who has written some really good books on the history of India. And uh, that battle is still going on and that is obviously essentially a tension between the need to be politically correct and the academic need to be intellectually honest and uh, to speak with uh, clarity and, uh, and have certain sense of uh, commitment to whatever is uh, true. Um, uh, and especially one of the fashions today obviously is deconstructionism and we talked about it last um, week with reference to Buddhism as deconstructionism par excellence giving you techniques of deconstructing uh, your very notion of self that you exist as a self and uh, that is um, very much part of the academic world today and this is a case where these two trends of political correctness and deconstructionism or intellectual integrity are colliding and the Hindus are a powerful lobbies which are trying to fight. Now, it so happens that most of the Hindus here are upper caste Hindus and therefore they feel hurt. Uh, specifically what is hurting them by the way Hinduism is portrayed in the textbooks here is the theory that Aryans came from outside and they invaded India and they brought Hinduism to India. So, Hinduism is not a native Indian religion. Uh, this hurts because uh, Hindus have been attacking Christians that this is an alien religion being brought to uh, India and Islam is an alien religion being brought to India. And uh, once it's uh, the scholars show that Hinduism itself is an alien religion which came with Aryans to India around the same time as Abraham or Moses perhaps 3500 to 4000 years ago. Uh, it, it hurts the Hindu sensibi sensibilities, but the lower castes who are also victims of Hinduism, they love that. Uh, they do not have much voice in California, but their voice is becoming powerful in India. Uh, a, one gentleman who is additional commissioner of income tax, a sort of Indian IRS, uh, uh, Rajendra Pandya. He has produced about 100 CDs and tapes and cassettes and I have been listening to some of them. I heard two of them yesterday. They are in Hindi, so you cannot hear, but you cannot understand them, but they are really powerful uh, critique of uh, Hinduism as a Aryan idea which came to India, subjugated India, brought caste system and untouchability and oppressed women and he goes into it is an intellectual, moral, uh, spiritual attack on Hinduism and that is the sort of conflict although their voice is not being heard in the debate in California, but some of the academics who are speaking on their behalf. Um, they are representing that voice that um, Hinduism has been a uh, is the cause as we will see in few minutes of so much of the oppression and injustice in India. But that is not our topic today. Hinduism in India uh, according to all the scholarship that is available today, although as I explained Hindus do not like the idea is that it came with the Aryans anywhere from 3000 to 4000 years ago. And the earliest scriptures, the Vedas, there are four, four Vedas, uh, some of them were written before or composed rather before the Aryans came into India, though quite a bit was added because these were oral hymns memorized. There was quite a lot of room for addition because they were not really written down, there was not any point of authority which with uh, through which you could compare whether this is the original scripture or this is the original um, Veda. Uh, so, they kept growing, so there is a um, lot of fresh material uh, added to them. But Vedas are not the only scriptures, Hinduism is not a religion which is based on a particular scriptures. Uh, what gives continuity to Hinduism is the fact that priests have to be Brahmins uh, born in a particular caste. 
it is Brahmins who give continuity or structure uh, to religion. The doctrine and scriptures they can keep changing. You can believe one particular set of scriptures or another set of scriptures. So, after the Vedas came Upanishads and Puranas and um, religious codes such as Manusmriti, which was the most important code uh, about how what is right living, how should different people, husbands and wives and kings and priests, everybody should relate to one another. And then the epics that are better known, the, the many epics, but Ramayana and Mahabharata being the most important ones. Mahabharata is uh, the big epic, part of it is a discourse with Sri Krishna, one of the gods gave to a particular warrior Arjuna uh, during a battlefield. Arjuna does not want to kill his cousins, his teachers, his uncles uh, for the sake of the kingdom which consisted of five small villages. He says this massacre is not worth it, but Krishna teaches him that since you are born in uh, the warrior caste, it is your duty to fight and you have to fight without any concern for the fruit. Uh, etcetera. So, it, this philosophical discourse which is given in this context of war is uh, one of the most uh, uh, philosophical and best known of Hindu scriptures that has been highly respected in the west. Uh, but once again this is not our subject today. Hinduism has been India's dominant philosophy and religion. Other religions such as Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism uh, and many other uh, religions, they arose in reaction to Hinduism and we talked some of it uh, in the previous lectures, but and Hinduism continues to be the dominant religion. Uh, what is, how does Hinduism, what does Hinduism look like today in India? Well, at one level Hinduism in India is stronger today than it has ever been. Philosophically it is stronger because there has been tremendous scholarship and uh, um, scholarly activity, intellectual activity. So, philosophically Hinduism is stronger today perhaps than at any other time in history. It is stronger economically because India is becoming an economic superpower and much of this economic power is being controlled by the upper castes who believe in Hinduism and Hinduism is also politically stronger today than it has been during the last thousand years uh, since Islam started invading India. So, for about 700 years or so political power was with Muslims and then for 200 years or so the political power was with the British and uh, then for 50 years, 60 years with the secularists, but about 10 years ago uh, Hindus began to acquire political power. So, it it is stronger today than it has ever been, but that is its problem because a resurgence of Hinduism is a huge threat to the lower caste Indians uh, 70 to 80 to 85 percent of Indians who have been treated as lower castes. They hate the idea because uh, democracy has taught them that in fact all human beings are equal. Uh, one fundamental assumption of democracy is equality of all human beings, whereas Hinduism is a hierarchical system where human beings are not equal. They are created un unequal, they are born unequal because of their karma in previous life. So, um, uh, that idea as it has been inculcated and as the lower castes who are numerically stronger have acquired political power. Uh, they are challenging and threatening. Uh, they feel threatened by the growing resurgence of Hinduism and they are fighting back. So, as a result of that Hinduism is in fact collapsing in India. Now, that is not an idea which uh, upper caste media, uh, media controlled by the upper caste English speaking would acknowledge or would talk about or average Hindu that you meet here in California. Uh, who comes from India, he is not going to acknowledge that yes this is true, but that is simply because he does not have uh, social relationships and does not interact with the Indian masses. 
there have been during the last, uh, last 100 years was a secular century in India. The majority were religious people, but secularism, although it was a minority point of view, it was the dominant culture shaping force. There were three secular views or world views or viewpoints that emerged in India during the last 100 years. Every world view has to answer the question, what is wrong with the world? And the first answer in India was that British colonialism is India's number one problem. So this is the problem. What's the solution? Independence is the solution. This idea became identified with the name of Mahatma Gandhi, but it was largely the point of view of the upper castes. And uh, now this particular idea has lost its emotional power and uh, punch. This idea was actually born here in America in the American Revolution that colonialism is a problem. It was a very biblical idea and that's why it moved uh, small peasants uh, in small churches in rural America to take up arms against uh, British colonialism. The idea was secularized in India, but even before it began to be secularized, the idea came to India with the British missionary movement, with Charles Grant, William Wilberforce, William Carey, Macaulay, Trevelyan, etc. Some of them came as administrators, some came as missionaries. Uh, it, through them, the idea came to India. But gradually, the idea began to be secularized. John Stuart Mill, who wrote a book on liberty in India, a utilitarian philosopher. He was the most important person to secularize uh, the worldview that grew out of American Revolution. By the beginning of this, uh, the 20th century, 100 years ago, uh, the idea had been essentially secularized, was part of Protestant liberalism, that colonialism is the problem, independence is the solution, and became in the public consciousness, global consciousness, identified with Mahatma Gandhi and uh, d uh, became a very influential idea in India. But even at that time, when Mahatma Gandhi was championing it, or before he began championing it, uh, the lower caste rejected the idea. Their point of view was that uh, we were animals in India. We be began to become human beings only after British colonialism came to India. The first time education became available to us, government positions became available to us. So we really like colonialism. We don't want the British to go. Um, but if the British are going, they need to create institutions in place so that the benefits of political freedom accrue to all of us equally. It's like the situation in Iraq, that the Sunnis don't want uh, freedom uh, because then Shiites get power in a democracy. If you're really become, be, becoming democracy or majority rule, then how do you ensure that the majority will not become tyrannical towards the minority? Uh, because this isn't part of our culture. This, uh, whoever has power uses it to the fullest and uses it to oppress others. This is sort of the tension in Iraq and this was a very real problem in India, that if, in, if the British leave and India becomes a feudal state, uh, what happens to us? This is heart of Arun Shori's attack on Ambedkarism. He wrote a book on, against Ambedkar uh, called Worshipping False Gods. And his attack on Ambedkar is that Ambedkar didn't really accept the idea that colonialism is the number one evil and independence is what India needs. The second worldview said, that India's problem is capitalism and therefore solution is socialism. There was a whole spectrum of socialists from militant Marxists to armchair uh, economists, but the most important name in India perhaps was Ram Manohar Lohia, uh, a blacksmith, someone from a blacksmith caste who mentored the socialist leadership of um, a number of people who are now still ruling most of North India, Mulayan Singh Yadav, Lallu Prasad Yadav, Nitish Kumar, 
Um, uh, uh, th these are backward caste leaders. The backward castes in India, uh, this is a technical term, a legal term, backward castes, uh, which is considered by Mandal Commission to be approximately 52% of India, which includes some Muslim castes. Uh, the third idea, you know, this idea again came from British universities, became popular in India, was imposing a Marxist worldview on Indian reality. Now, it was a silly idea because India never was a capitalist country. There were people with money, but none of that money was acquired by people managing capital carefully. Anybody who has capital in India, he had looted from others or cheated from others. That's how he got the capital. He didn't invest it, he displayed it and then looted more for his daily expenses. Uh, so we, we never had capitalism in India. And even today, after 10 years of economic reforms, um, people who are benefiting from a free market economy don't necessarily understand it. So both of these uh, two worldviews, the worldview of the upper caste and the worldview of the backward castes, has collapsed. The first one has lost its uh, emotional power, and it never had much intellectual power anyway. Uh, because Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, they are all British colonies. Why are they better than us? If colonialism is evil, why are they better than us? And why is India so much better than Nepal? The only way to understand that is uh, that we had the benefits of colonialism. Nepal didn't have the benefit of colonialism. So it, it, the idea never had a much uh, intellectual appeal. Uh, and uh, strength, and it now has no emotional strength either. So the ideologies of the upper caste and the backward caste has collapsed. The third idea that began to grow in India, uh, beginning in 1935, said that India's problem is actually Hinduism. Therefore, there is no solution for India, except which does not include conversion. Conversion has to be an integral part of solution. There will, solution will have many facets, education, political, economy, technological, etc. But uh, conversion will have to be a very integral part of that solution. Now this was an idea again which came from the missionary movement, but it was secularized by Dr. Ambedkar and this was essentially a secular uh, worldview. Uh, he studied, he first um, made this public in 1935 and 1936. He gave a lecture in defense of conversion, which is up on the internet, uh, if you want to understand it. Very powerful lecture. Um, and um, that idea began to grow. It became uh, part of the worldview of the schedule caste that we call Dalit. Uh, the schedule was something drawn up by a British member of parliament, John Simon, uh, which is about 15% of the castes that testified before this British commission, Simon Commission, that we are the untouchables. Therefore, we want special um, affirmative action uh, in our favor. And uh, that uh, uh, this became their worldview. Now, for the last 60 years or so, they didn't have intellectual skills, social skills, political skills to spread their worldview. They didn't have the means to spread Ambedkar's idea. Therefore, uh, this idea that Hinduism is the problem and uh, uh, solution has to include conversion didn't really take off in India. It grew in Maharashtra uh, with the Dalit Panthers but from 1980 onwards. A whole underground literary movement began in North India, which has now produced something like 500 titles. And uh, it's now coming up as an English uh, literary revolution as well, uh, which is propagating this worldview. And as a resu result of this um, tremendous literary activity and artistic activity, which has spilled over into political arena, and there has been a political mobilization based on this idea that Hinduism is the problem and therefore conversion has to be part of the solution, which is leading to a collapse of Hinduism. Now many of these people were converting to Buddhism, uh, but uh, now increasingly 
they are turning to Christ as perhaps a much better hope uh, for India and for them. There are a number of reasons that we can talk about. I won't take too much time on it. Just briefly in passing, that Hinduism has tried to defend itself from these attacks in two major ways. One was a Hindu social reform movement, which Raja Ram Mohan Roy started in the beginning of the 19th century and uh, continued. Mahatma Gandhi was perhaps the end of that whole 100 year old tradition of Hindu social reform movement. This, this movement saw the pre modern, the medieval Hinduism indeed as a problem, and it saw the solution in terms of reforming Hinduism rather than discarding Hinduism. Uh, and that was a Hindu social reform movement that Hinduism is okay, it has some evils that have become associated with it and those evils are not intrinsic to Hinduism, they can be removed and you can have a purified reformed version of Hinduism. That movement has failed, it has collapsed. It, it, it had some uh, limited localized success, but essentially it has not taken off. So, the second movement that uh, really came, uh, became powerful during the 1980s and then took political power in the 1990s was a Hindutva movement. Uh, which said that the real problem of, of India is secularism or minorityism, uh, the Congress party's desire to appease Muslims and appease Christians. This is the problem. Salvation for India would re mean returning to um, purer form of Hinduism or at least if we can't define Hinduism in terms of doctrines or theologies or philosophy at least to a feeling of Hinduness, but this also it, it succeeded up to a point for a few years and uh, did uh, give political power to this party uh, for six years or so, but the whole movement has essentially collapsed as a uh, intellectually credible movement. It still has some political power because uh, you uh, th there is not much alternative, but as an ideology uh, that has collapsed. So, that is the overview of uh, Hinduism in India. I should conclude that just with a very brief quick personal statement that uh, although I am a Christian, I do not agree with Dr. Ambedkar's formulation that Hinduism is India's problem, because India's problem is sin. And sin comes in many different forms and shapes and brands. Hinduism could be a brand of sin, but Christianity could be a brand of sin and Islam and Buddhism and communism and socialism could be different brands of sin. When you look at Hinduism as the problem, you are nurturing a spirituality of hate that the Hindus or the Brahmins, they are the source of problem. We have to eradicate them. When you look at sin as the problem, you look at your own heart and uh, you turn inside and you seek freedom from uh, the, um, the, the fact of sin, uh, which is the real evil, but that is something that we will not pursue today, uh, but I thought that it is necessary for me to make that statement that uh, Ambedkar's idea that Hinduism is India's problem and conversion is a solution, is a secular worldview, is it? It is not a Christian worldview. And it is not necessarily a solution to India. It could aggravate the problems, although their fight for justice, for dignity, for equality is something that I identify with. And in fact, those of you who want to pursue that, I have a book uh, called uh, The Quest for Freedom and Dignity, which helps you understand this whole battle that is going on in India. But let us leave that there and return to the question of Hinduism in the West, because this whole series is about postmodern West meeting or encountering pre modern East. The Hinduism began to come to the West, first of all, through the 19th century Indologists, who were administrators, judges, missionaries, uh, rulers in India and uh, many of them came scholars to study the wisdom of the East. They, uh, they systematized ideas, they uh, interpreted 
Hinduism to the West, not necessarily always accurately, but uh, they, you can say that they created a particular understanding of Hinduism, which continues till today. Now, 100 years or so later, Swami Vivekananda came to the first parliament of world religions in Chicago and uh, made a presentation about Hinduism, which became very powerful and uh, for the first time ordinary people began to actually accept Hindu worldview. So, he started in the west what is still existing as Ramakrishna mission, but again this problem of a universal religion versus a particular religion, whether Hinduism is an ethnic religion or a universal religion became an issue to the point uh, that Ramakrishna mission has had to fight a, a decades long legal battle in India that we are not Hinduism, we are not a religion, we, we are not Hinduism because it was really Hindu worldview uh, which Ramakrishna mission was spreading rather than Hinduism as a religion. Now, uh, following that of course, was um, uh, the number of people who began to have an impact on India, Mahatma Gandhi being one of them and uh, apologists like uh, Radha Krishnan, who was uh, the pro a pro professor of Hinduism in Oxford, who took the chair uh, where R.C. Zener, the famous Catholic authority on Hinduism. Uh, held that uh, professorship in Oxford. And then here in America, you have Paramhansa Yogananda in the 1950s, who was a powerful voice for Hinduism and yoga. But Hinduism's popular appeal in the West took off in the 1960s with the countercultural movement when the hippies began to discover Hindu gurus and bring them here or Beatles went to India and there um, they really gave tremendous um, publicity to the guru movement, transcendental meditation, Hare Krishna, uh, Osho Rajneesh, uh, the guru who had a huge ranch in uh, Oregon and who taught tantra and sexual mysticism um, particularly, but many other things, he was a great speaker. Uh, professor of philosophy, a really good scholar, that movement was very powerful in the 1960s. But then more serious transformation of the western worldview really came in the 1980s with the new age movement, uh, where uh, the west seriously began to come to grips with the essence or some of the uh, essence of uh, Hindu philosophy and began to actually believe and it as a worldview and uh, propagate it as a worldview. So, that, that's, that's going to be the focus of our rest of the lecture and that's the main point for today. Um, but, um, so it, it is not a one uh, system of belief, we can, is in, in India itself not only are there a number of um, uh, scriptures which are very different from one another, completely different no consistency, no, uh, because Hinduism is not a religion in the sense of Christianity is, where you can have some yardsticks of orthodoxy and heterodoxy, uh, that is not there. There are six completely different uh, schools of philosophy in Hinduism. So, we, we obviously cannot be covering all of that. Now, in the new age movement, a very important uh, foundational reason which deserves to be taken respectfully and seriously is a belief that Hinduism offers a possible and a much better philosophical framework for understanding uh, insights gained from contemporary physics than materialism or naturalism. Let me explain that. Einstein said that one of the most incomprehensible things about the universe is that it is comprehensible. 
why is it that the human mind can understand invisible laws of the cosmos that regulate this cosmos and articulate those laws in our words, in our mathematics, words that can be understood by others, tested, verified, falsified and used to build technologies based on which you can plan a journey to the moon and back. So, why is the universe the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. There are three possible uh, answers for that and Hinduism is the latest possible answer. The first answer obviously is the Judeo-Christian answer which gave birth to modern science and uh, turned uh, science into a revolution, scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th century. And that answer was a simple biblical answer that there is a God who is a rational being. He created this universe with his mind, with his wisdom, with his rationality. He made us in his image. So, our rationality resembles God's rationality and it is given to us so that we might use it to establish our dominion over this earth as God's children as God's representatives. So, our mind is able to understand uh, this universe because there is a given correlation between rationality that created and regulates this universe and rationality which is in us because we are in fact the image of the creator. This was the biblical answer. So, uh, the, to answer the question how come that the invisible laws this, that regulate this universe can be captured in words, in human words. The uh, biblical answer to that was that because behind the physical universe are words, God's words. The words are behind the universe, therefore our words can in fact read and articulate the laws of natures. But materialism or scientism or naturalism which said that there is no supernatural nature, but only nature. There is no God, there is no spirits, man does not have, is not a spiritual being, but we are only biological evolution, we are only matter. That whole world view which grew out of Darwinianism, materialism or naturalism did not believe that there is a rationality behind this universe. The universe is a product of random chance, blind chance. Whatever is product of blind chance or, or a product of irrationality, you cannot understand it rationally. You know, if a child scribbles something on paper, you might be able to read something into it that, well, this looks like an elephant, um, could be a camel. Um, but you are imposing order, meaning, rationality into what he has drawn. It really is nothing. So, if uh, you know 20 different people bring, um, Katrina has demolished lots of houses and we collect all the bricks and all the stones and all the wood and all the glass and all the furniture and dump it into a huge, you know, 20 mile uh, dumping ground. Uh, a lot of people have been dumping into it. This is chance what falls here and what falls there. Now, you might be able to see that this looks like Taj Mahal. You know, you might be able to impose some sort of an order on it out of your imagination. But in fact, what is a product of blind chance is not going to have a rational uh, under, you, you, mind cannot understand what is not a product of mind. It is a chance product. It has no, uh, nobody design any uh, shape. There is no design. Now, that, uh, so that whole explanation of materialism for a number of reasons, which is not the focus of our lecture today, has become unacceptable. So, Hinduism has become a third option and that is what we want to uh, look at. Uh, what Hinduism and materialism share in common 
is monism. Everything is one, that's monism. But what is this nature of the ultimate oneness? Materialism or scientism is saying that material energy, physical energy is the ultimate reality and the only reality, only thing that exists is matter. So everything is material, there is no spirit, there is no God, there are no demons, there are no angels, there is no supernatural. So that's monism, but a materialistic monism. Hinduism is saying that no, th there is only one reality, but it is not physical energy, but psychic energy or consciousness or spirit or soul, God, Brahma. Now that's pantheism because you can call it God. It's, it's not a personal God, but what exists, the only reality that exists is consciousness or psychic energy or spirit energy. That is what is manifesting itself throughout the universe. So both uh, materialism and Hinduism are monism except that Hinduism you can call pantheism because it says that what exists is in fact divine, is in fact God. You are God, God is within you, the essence of you is God. How, why is this idea a possible interpretation of what this universe is all about? You know, how can you believe that you are God? Well, you might be willing to believe that you are God, but certainly you'll have a hard time believing that your spouse is God or your mo mother-in-law is God. Uh, you know, that's hard, hard to believe. You wish it was true, but um, you think it's, it's you know, it can't be true. But, but anyway, so how do you believe that uh, everything that exists is in fact God? Well, Einstein would be a good starting point if, if we are focusing on uh, from new physics to Hinduism, because Einstein's equation that energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, E is equal to mc squared, it didn't simply usher in the atomic age, our ability to split atom and to use atom for all sorts of things, good and bad. That equation demolished the 19th century scientific paradigm. During the 19th century, physics and chemistry were two absolutely separate compartments. There was an unbridgeable wall of separation between physics and chemistry. Physics was studying energy, energy existed as sound and light and heat and motion and gravity, uh, etc. Chemistry studied matter and matter existed as 93, 96, 99, whatever, different elements, different atoms which couldn't be destroyed, therefore couldn't be created, therefore had to exist eternally. So the material universe consisted of physical matter or chemical matter, atoms, which had to be eternal, a plurality which exists forever. These were two completely different disciplines. But what Einstein's equation did was to demolish that wall of separation. All of a sudden, the let's say 103 or whatever elements now are believed to exist, they all became one energy of physics. So if you break these atoms, what you get is so much energy. So everything now is suddenly one energy. Einstein went beyond that. Not only matter and energy were one, but space and time were one. You no longer had a three-dimensional space and one-dimensional time, but you had a four-dimensional space-time continuum. So he demolished the distinction between space and time. A little later, to jump ahead of Einstein, but pretty soon after Einstein, when the quantum mechanics began to develop, the subatomic physics, you could now go inside the atom because atom can be split and study what is inside the atom. One of the amazing things that the scientists discovered uh, as part of the uh, quantum mechanics was the interconnectedness 
of the electrons. This is moving towards the new age. Uh, David Bohm and uh, Fritz of Capra and many of the uh, uh, physicists who actually began to turn to Hindu mysticism. Uh, this interconnectedness of the electrons was a very critical thing. Now, it is uh, not too difficult to understand. Just imagine two coins being minted in the same mint at the same time with same material and therefore, they are really interconnected. And suppose that they are interconnected in such a way in such a magical way that you flip both the coins mechanically using absolutely the same amount of energy or pressure etcetera. They rotate and when they fall what if first coin is heads up the other will be tails. If the first is tail up the other will be head up. This will always be uh, how they would fall. Uh, it does not matter how you keep them. You can keep them both facing head up on the machine or you can face them both keeping tail up or one this way, one that way. When you flip them for some reason, they always fall the same way at the same time. Now, it is not just if you are doing this in the experiment in the same machine in the same room. If you took one here and the other in Australia and flipped them at the same moment using exactly identical machines, identical pressure, they would still behave the same way. Now, since we know that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, the information how does the coin B know what uh, position coin A is taking? Well, there is no physical way of it having that information. Why is it connected? How are they connected? Uh, maybe they are same, they are one. Now, getting into the quantum mechanics itself, the point is that you have two electrons, they are spinning, whether vertical, vertical spin or horizontal spin. And let us imagine that they are spinning in opposite direction to the point in such a way that the numerical value of their spin is 0. It is exactly the same velocity etcetera. Well, does not matter how you measure it, how you separate it and how you spin them. The way one does, the other does exactly the opposite and the value remains 0 whether you keep one in Los Angeles and the other in Laodicea or whatever, uh, does not matter what the difference, they behave exactly the same. You know. Obviously, this has not been uh, tested experimentally over thousands of miles, but it has been tested for short distances and it has been shown that they are amazingly a one system. This has become the basis for astrology, belief in astrology that everything in the universe is interconnected. Uh, we are connected to the stars and planets etcetera, which has become the intellectual foundation for astrology which we will consider in another lecture. But for now, uh, what Einstein began with uh, physics and energy being physics and chemistry being one, space and time being one, uh, moving on to quantum mechanics of electrons being interconnected has begun to give credibility to the idea that maybe everything is one. Now, the problem obviously remains is that the Cartesian dichotomy has been so much a part of the West, mind and matter, the dualism of mind and matter. Okay, physics and chemistry are one, energy and uh, matter are one, but what about mind and matter? Are mind and matter one? The another discovery of the quantum physics was or subatomic physics was that the observer and the observed phenomenon are inseparable. When you begin to, when you are working in a cloud chamber as a physicist and you are observing uh, the subatomic phenomenon, then the fact of what you choose to observe the question you ask in a sense determines the outcome, the answer that the uh, subatomic particles give. So, in a mysterious way, the mind and matter, the observer and the observed 
cannot be separated. So the uh, basic, one basic assumption of science that we must be objective. Uh, I am the subject who is studying the phenomenon and this is the object and the science must be objective. This simply is not possible uh, at this level. So, ultimately the mind and matter may well be one. So, now from here from empirical observable science you come into scientific speculation of philosophy and a critical figure there is uh, Tilhard de Chardin. Uh, Chardin was a Jesuit uh, French Jesuit paleontologist studying um, fossils biology and evolution in France and wrote a number of books. The Catholic Church was really afraid of his books and banned them and he was good enough Catholic to obey and not to publish his books during his lifetime. So, they were published after he died 1959 was his book The Phenomenon of Man, which is not an easy book to read, but the argument actually is quite simple. What Chardin is doing in that book is providing the philosophical foundation, a possible philosophical foundation for Hindu pantheism, a monism uh, that all is God and all is psychic energy or divine consciousness. His argument putting it in my words very simply is that if you have an experiment in which carbon and oxygen are interacting, you can get carbon monoxide CO, you can get carbon dioxide CO2, you might get carbon trioxide CO3, but you will never get water which is a H2O. The reason for that is that at the beginning of the equation, you have carbon and oxygen, you do not have hydrogen. Then water is hydrogen and oxygen H2O. What is not there at the beginning cannot appear at the end uh, uh, till Chardin argues, de Chardin argues. If water has appeared in that uh, experiment, then it must have been present from the very beginning. Now, he is a biologist, he is a paleontologist and he is saying that it is ok to not bother with consciousness in physics or chemistry or even botany, but by the time you come to insects consciousness is part of reality. Uh, by the time animals you it is foolish to ignore consciousness uh, in dogs and cats and other animals and when you are looking at man, well you are you can, cannot be a scientist and a rule consciousness out of the equation, because in fact consciousness is the basis for all knowledge, all information, uh, all science that we are doing. So, consciousness has emerged on the other side of the experiment, therefore it must have been there from the very beginning. So, what, what has come must have been there from the beginning. Okay. So, consciousness has been there from the very beginning what is evolving? He says insects have very little consciousness, animals have little more, mammals have lot more, man is fully conscious unless a boring lecturer puts you to sleep, you are fully conscious, uh, self conscious. So, what is evolving is consciousness. Consciousness must have been there from the beginning of evolution. And if consciousness has been there from the beginning of evolution, then it is reasonable to assume that in fact consciousness has been driving the whole process of evolution. And in fact it is consciousness which is, which is evolving. Is there any reason to assume that evolution has stopped? Tilard and Chardin goes on to argue that there is no reason to assume that evolution has stopped with man. If not, what then will be the next stage of evolution? You are self conscious, but you are conscious of yourself as a finite self which has limited consciousness, there are lots of things you do not know, you do not understand. So, the next stage of evolution will be evolution of enhanced consciousness, unity consciousness, omega point he calls it. Uh, you are seeing your oneness with everything. So, matter is energy, physical energy is in fact psychic energy, is in fact consciousness, is in fact in the mind. 
this consciousness is in fact what is evolving, you have that consciousness which is in everything, you have to experience it. So far evolution was a blind random process. Now that you are a self-conscious creature, a human being, you have got to take charge of your evolution and you have to practice yoga and meditation and psychotechnologies to become God. Now that's where you have a whole philosophical movement which has suddenly become Hindu. That okay, what he's saying is in fact perhaps what the Hindu sages have been saying all along. That God is within you, you can go within yourself, then you will become oblivious of the physical universe, and you will become one with the universe. So this oneness of everything, including mind and matter, including the observer and the observed, then leads to a related Hindu idea of the world as Maya, world as illusion, world as, world as not real. Now behind it is uh, a Kantian philosophy which is resurfaced in this whole movement, uh, Kantian, Immanuel Kant's idea that you know, the observer and the, and the observer are one, not just uh, in that uh, physical physics experiments of cloud chamber, but they are one philosophically because you actually never have a direct experience of the external world. You're touching this, what does that mean? You're seeing me, what does that mean? You're hearing me, but what does hearing mean? It simply means that in your brain, certain parts of your brain, different cortex of the brain, you have sensations which those sensations, mind is performing some complex uh, mathematical um, um, what's the feats to interpret those sensations as me, as sound, as light, as color, as hardness, as softness, a heat, a smell, you know, stink or whatever. Um, these are interpretations, everything that you are observing, the world that you are seeing is in fact in your mind. You have no way of knowing if there is an objective universe. You know, this idea had really begun with Berkeley, um, given philosophical foundations with Kant and has come back, that the external world is in fact a creation of our mind, our imagination, its dream of Brahma, its Maya. One element that has reinforced that possible conclusion is uh, uh, the discovery of the hologram. A hologram is a three-dimensional photograph uh, taken with laser beams, etc. In a typical two-dimensional photograph, if a photograph get, gets damaged, it is damaged. You can't do anything about it. But with a hologram, if it breaks up, if it's damaged, it, one of its properties is that you can take any part of the hologram and recreate the whole. So any DNA uh, from uh, anyone's body, for any part of any body, has information about the whole of you, that this is really you. So the universe is perhaps not only interconnected, but is a hologram, is an image created by your mind. God is within you, this is all God. Now you begin to see the impact of this worldview. The, the implications of this worldview. The Christian view of reality, a Christian worldview was that the relationship of God and the universe is relationship of the painter and the painting, the musician and the music, the sculptor and the uh, sculpted. A painting can tell you a lot about the painter, so in a sense the painter is in the painting, you know that this is Picasso, this is Rembrandt, etc. But essentially the painter and the painting are distinct. 
the creator and the creation are two different things, two different uh, objects or uh, uh, identities. But the Hindu idea of the universe is that the universe and God don't relate as the painter and the painting, but the dancer and the dance. The dance and the dancer are not two, are not two separate things. Dance is a particular mode of the dancer, a particular posture or activity of the dancer. The two are one. You are God. You don't know that you are God. You don't experience your divinity. You need to experience that by going within. That's the point of Hinduism. And that's uh, the, these different strands. And obviously, I haven't been comprehensive by any means. Uh, but I hope that I've given you uh, enough information so that you can begin to take uh, this worldview more respectfully than you have perhaps taken before, that how can anyone be so silly as to think that he is God uh, and try and then sit in meditation to experience his own divinity? It isn't silly. It is a very serious uh, worldview which is being experienced or being attempted uh, to be experienced by a number of people. Now, for those of you who want to pursue this really seriously, uh, my book on the New Age uh, has a big appendix. It's in the appendix because the editor thought that this is uh, too serious for most people to be part of the book. Let's, let's begin to summarize. This is a uh, growing serious movement, but what are the problems with it? Obviously, it is building on uh, uh, Einstein's uh, view, which Einstein himself wouldn't agree with, Einstein isn't saying E is equal to mc squared isn't saying that matter is energy. Because at the very minimum, matter is energy plus laws. Where do the laws of nature come from? You can call them properties. Where do those peculiar properties of hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen come from to create a stable universe? All of these people are amazed by the oneness of everything, physics and chemistry and uh, mind and matter, etc., etc. But the simple fact is that the oneness is given. The Christian worldview has always seen the rea reality, the cosmos, as a universe, as a united, interrelated uh, system. That's why the Christian scientists up to Einstein, and once again now after 30 years or so after Einstein, have been looking for a unified field theory. What gives unity to everything? This has been part of the scientific quest. So unity is given, as, as the New Testament puts it, that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, this word created everything, this word sustains everything. Everything is in fact related, interconnected, is one. The real question for a scientist is, how is this one reality appears as multiplicity and stable, orderly universe, if you want to call it a dance of energy, uh, a beautiful uh, a choreo choreography of energy. Why does this multiplicity appear to be real? And that's where the whole process of creation comes. If you look in Genesis 1, uh, the process of creation is a process of separation. In the beginning, God, God, it was darkness. God said, let there be light. Uh, and he separated light from darkness. He separated water from water. He separated water from land. And then he created plants, each after its own kind, and animals, each after its own kind. So, how this differentiation happens in nature. Why do nature have has laws? It has laws because it has a lawgiver. The universe, the energy obeys his word. So the whole scientific uh, quest is not simply a quest to experience that oneness. But to, but to manage the diversity of this creation, the beauty of this creation, 
that is what science and technology are all about. So, the, the whole direction far from giving a philosophy of science is undermining science. Science has to assume that the material reality is real, material universe is real. It is not a dream, it is not an illusion, it is not Maya, uh, it is not a hologram, it is real, it is rational that my mind can in fact understand it. And it is not only rational, it is valuable, it is good and that is what Genesis account is telling us that God creates one day and say this is good, this is good, this is good and this is very good. Because creation is valuable, that is what leads to ecology as we will talk about another day. That is what leads to science and technology, to our desire to understand it and to establish our dominion over it. So, science has to assume uh, the reality and rationality and the value of the material universe. But this monism and pantheism that everything is one and to know the reality is to experience that oneness and to uh, get rid of the mind uh, and uh, we did not pursue that the implication of pursuing that monism is to develop a whole new epistemology which replaces the epistemology of science, of empirical observation, trusting our senses and logic of mathematics which Newton is developing mathematics as the language of science, uh, log mathematical logic which uh, interprets the sensory data of experiments to uh, mysticism or Hinduism goes directly opposite to that, that we cannot trust our senses, we cannot trust our logic. Uh, we have to through yoga, through other forms of meditation, we have got to destroy uh, the normal methods of knowing truth, knowing reality and we have to uh, silence of our mind, empty our minds of all thoughts, all words because thinking is wrong uh, etcetera, etcetera. Now, these, uh, this approach of killing the mind, killing um, in the scientific mind, the scientific epistemology which began to develop from the 16th century onwards is in fact uh, supported, the rejection of the scientific uh, method of knowing is rejected through a number of things like it assumes, the science assumes a law of non-contradiction. Is law of non-contradiction real? Well, uh, a cannot be non-A at the same time and apple cannot be banana at the same time um, uh, uh, because I, is it an apple or is it a banana? That is a con if you believe it is both it is a contradiction, but when you begin to actually look into physics you find that it is wave and it is particle, is it wave or is it particle? How can the same light be both, both wave and particle at the same time? Uh, these problems began to come, but these are in fact pseudo problems. It is neither the for example, light is neither wave nor particle, it is what they call now wavicle. What is a wavicle? Now, we do not understand what a wavicle is simply because it does not correspond to anything in the macro world. It is a part of the micro world, we would be able to comprehend it if it corresponded to something in the macro world, but it does not mean that it is a contradiction of law of reality. All of these facts that I have been outlining which are used to undermine science are in fact, we are discovering them through the scientific method and you have to assume the validity of the scientific method in order to get to uh, the conclusion that David Baum and Fritz of Capra and uh, etc. these physicists are reaching to. But I will not go more into the details, but if you want more serious treatment of it, do look at it in this book and there is also the other book, The World of Gurus. But what does all of this mean? To summarize, if you accept this whole world view that everything is one, God, it is all within me, you have to not only give up 
belief that this universe is real, it's rational, it's good, it's valuable, you have to come to the conclusion that your notion of your individual self is also illusion. The idea of human rights is illusion. The duality of good and evil is an illusion that God, in fact, is the devil. You have to, you have to become one with everything, and ultimately that's what Hinduism is. Uh, if you want, to, this is too complicated, too long a lecture. If you want a very simple answer, what is Hinduism? You know, a gentleman, a Hindu guru went to a hamburger vendor and he said, make me one with everything. <laughs> that, that's Hinduism, make me one with everything. Everything is one. Now, what is the implication of that? Let me conclude with one story that uh, summarizes the implication of that. And this is the story of the enlightenment of Swami Muktananda, uh, who lived south of uh, Bombay, Ganeshpuri in Maharashtra. He has enormous following in the West, uh, who brought Kundalini Yoga uh, to the West, Siddha Yoga, the perfect yoga. He understood this philosophy that everything is one. I perceive myself as distinct from you. I even hate you. Um, but in fact, I need to experience my oneness with everything. So he went to all the holy places in India, met with all the holy men, enlightened men. But more he lived with them, more he got to know them, more disappointed he became that there isn't really any enlightened men in India. You know, Swami Vivekananda, who brought uh, Ramakrishna Mission and Vedanta to, uh, to North America, his guru, uh, Ramakrishna Paramhansa, when he was enlightened, he was sitting in his hut for three days, and the guru who taught him the techniques of enlightenment, he was outside the hut. Both were enlightened, both had become one with everything, but the guru outside didn't know what is going on inside in, in his brain. Now, two have become one, you know, like two computers being interconnected. My special consultant takes over my computer. He sits in Colorado Springs, he takes over my computer, and he can work on my computer. He knows everything what's there in my computer. Um, so you've become one with everything, all you are connected, you've become one with everything, but you don't know what's going on uh, inside. So the guru was panicking, finally he broke into the hut and found Ramakrishna Paramhansa almost dead. Um, so anyway, that experience becomes sort of suspicious that if he is truly enlightened, why hasn't he become one with everything? Why doesn't he know everything, everyone's mind? Anyway, so Muktananda was disappointed that I can't find in India any guru who has really become one with everything. He was just about ready to give up his religious quest. When he was passing through outside a town, we still only about 20% of India has indoor toilets. They may not work if you don't have running water, but at least 20% of the homes have toilets. Back then, uh, much fewer had toilets. Most people went outside. If you were too embarrassed to go outside and had the space, you had a room outside your house, uh, you squat, there would be tin under it, you did your business there, the sweeper woman will come in the morning, she will pull that um, container outside and uh, scrape it all without gloves, with a little tin, maybe rusty tin, put it in a basket, uh, the night soil they call it, carry it on her head, dump it outside. So all the excreta was dumped outside the room uh, of the town, and that area would be just filthy and stinking. You don't want to go near there. But Muktananda was passing through there, and he saw a naked ascetic sitting on this pile of human excreta, fresh human excreta, sitting in eternal bliss, ecstatic. Well, you mock and laugh, but Muktananda was incisive enough to realize that this is an enlightenment. He has become one with everything. Uh, you can't, you can't discard some things and claim that you have become one with everything. Uh, so, uh, Muktananda asked him that, please, will you enlighten me? 
And he said, sure. So this naked ascetic sitting on this lofty throne invited Muktananda to come and sit on his lap. He manipulated his, um, well, whatever, and gave him an, an, an experience of enlightenment, taught him how to experience enlightenment through manipulating his own sexual organs. And then Muktananda went uh, into his hut. He bolted it from inside and sat in meditation. His kundalini was awakened. And we'll discuss this in, kund in the lecture on yoga, the kundalini yoga. His kundalini was awakened. The psychic energy began to rise. And he f uh, went through the seven uh, uh, chakras. And then he experienced his infinity, his oneness with God. He became God. But in that, ex when he describes that experience of enlightenment in his official biographies, it's a terrible ex description. He says that here I was sitting, I was feeling excruciating pain in this chakra and that chakra. I thought I'm, my head will burst, I'm going insane, and I saw deadly demons come through uh, my closed hut uh, as a ball of fire and enter me. And that's when I became enlightened one with God. Now, he uses the word demons uh, himself, that that's what I experienced in my becoming one. And he can say that um, in my enlightenment, demons entered me and gave me these very painful, crazy experiences. And I became God because in a outlook where everything is one, there is no final distinction between God and devil. In becoming God, you in fact become the devil, uh, which is what the uh, reality of Genesis 3, or the temptation of Satan, the serpent, that you eat this fruit and you will become God, uh, was really all about, that you will uh, turn Eden, a place of bliss, into pain and suffering and hell. Thank you very much.